Part 3. Equal Protection Under the Law Chapter 7. Justifiable Homicide and Case Law On the 6th of October, 1993, a 42-year-old man sat drunk in the stairway leading to the basement of his house, located at Rand and Third Streets, in the northwest section of the nation's capital. He wasn't alone, and he wasn't behaving well. In view of the neighbors sitting on the porches of their common alley, the man was sodomizing his three-year-old daughter. Tabitha Darden was one of the neighbors who could see what was happening on the steps. She shouted at the man and then grabbed a nearby two-by-four. The man threw a bottle at the approaching Miss Darden. As she continued toward the sodomite, quote, The little girl ran to me screaming, Please don't let him hurt me, recalled Miss Darden. Then the neighbor of the innocent child turned her piece of lumber into a weapon and broke the assailant's leg. He should get a hundred years. If he comes back around this way, he belongs to me. I tried to break his skull, said Miss Darden. I did what I had to do. The onlooking neighbors watched, apparently without objection. Miss Darden was not charged in the case. The law these days is ever-changing. The codes, if not attitudes, concerning sexual perversion are changing. Sodomy, legal de facto for many years due to non-enforcement of the code, was decriminalized in September 1993. It is now legal de jure to commit sodomy in Washington, D.C. If NAMBLA, the North American Man-Boy Love Association, gets its way and sodomy between adults and children is decriminalized, a citizen like Miss Darden in the future will be charged with assault, a hate crime, and who knows what else. For over a year, I had a cellmate in federal prison who was from Massachusetts. He had no particular sympathies concerning the circumstances of my inmate status, but he was glad that I, a relatively pleasant fellow, was sharing his cell. Jim was in his mid-fifties, a former building contractor and restaurant owner, suborned by big and easy money in cocaine traffic. He recounted to, off to me the story of a doctor in his hometown of Holyoke, who had an office across the street from Jim's father's business. The doctor had gone to prison in the mid-1940s for committing abortions. Jim couldn't recall whether the 10 years was the doctor's sentence or the actual time he spent in prison. He did remember it being a long time. How strange that what was wrong is now right. Are right and wrong interchangeable? No. And true law, the eternal law with capital L, of God does not change either. While it is the truth and true law with which Christians have a fundamental interest, the mutable laws of the land have temporal and conditional authority over Christians. In this chapter, we will identify two principles pertaining to the laws of our land. The first is the distinction which must be made between that which actually is legal, de jure, and that which is legal by default of the rulers. When rulers fail to punish violators, a given transgression becomes, in reality, de facto legal. A crime de jure becomes no longer a crime de facto. And what happens when the citizenry surrenders the authority of its written law codes to judges who disregard them? Are the judges' decisions in violations of the code to be respected as a new de jure law? Might not state governors ignore lawless court decrees? Or are they bribed into submission by federal funds? These, of course, are revolutionary questions. Are the people self-governing, or are they governed by tyrants? Or are they so morally abject that they don't care who or what rules them? In the case of Roe v. Wade, the infamous decision to make the killing of unborn children legal, what prevented the states, whose codes outlawed abortions, from continuing lawfully in adherence to their legally constituted laws? The states have a legal right to self-government by virtue not only of their own codes, but even federal law, the Tenth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which guarantees state sovereignty. And if a state government will not respect and enforce its own laws, what ought a righteous mayor do? How shall honest citizens who respect the laws du jour of the land behave? Shall they submit to the evol evolving de facto laws or to the true de jour laws?
will the threat of lawless punishment be the only determinant of their behavior. We think, rather, that if citizens wish to honor their state's true laws above the fiats of renegade judges, they do a good thing. Regarding the issue at hand, citizens who act on the principles of their state codes do not violate the law by taking defensive action in behalf of preborn people. They only violate the will of tyrants. The second principle pertaining to our laws, which we will examine in this chapter, is the legal doctrine of necessity. Laws may be justifiably broken in the course of preventing a harm. The argument has been admitted occasionally in court regarding blockades of abortuaries. The same argument which applies to the action of peaceful blockading of entrances to child slaughterhouses applies to force against either the facilities or the persons committing the crimes. Our nation did not begin in a legal vacuum, but neither did the colonies or the federal government enact codes to cover every conceivable legal issue. English common law was assumed as our court's own guide. Formally, on October 14, 1774, the Continental Congress issued its Declaration of Rights, stating that the colonists of the several states were entitled to the protections of the common law of England. That common law is a body of case law derived predominantly from Christian law and morality. A most fundamental example of governance by Christian case law is the historic criminality of blasphemy. Without a statute, blasphemy was held to be a crime at common law and punished in New York in 1811 in the People v. Ruggles and Johns, 225, 1811. The opinion by Chief Judge James Kent, one of the most influential American authorities on common law, became a classic. The defendant was indicted for that he did on the second day of September, 1810, wickedly, maliciously, and blasphemously utter and with a loud voice publish in the presence and hearing of divers good and Christian people, etc., of and concerning the Christian religion and of and concerning Jesus Christ, the faults, scandalous, malicious, wicked, and blasphemous words following, to wit, Jesus Christ was a bastard, and his mother must be a whore. In contempt of the Christian religion and the laws of this state, to the evil and pernicious example of all others. Wendell, for the prisoner, now contended that the offense charged in the indictment was not punishable by the law of this state, though he admitted it was punishable by the common law of England, where Christianity makes part of the law of the land, on account of its connection with the established church. Kent, C.H.J., delivered the opinion of the court. The language was blasphemous not only in a popular, but in a legal sense, for blasphemy, according to the most precise definitions, consists in maliciously reviling God or religion, and this was reviling Christianity through its author. Such words, uttered with such a disposition, were an offense at common law. In Taylor's case, 1 Vent 293, 3 Keb 607, Tremaine's Pleas of the Crown, 226 SC, the defendant was convicted upon information of speaking similar words, and the court of K.B. said that Christianity was parcel of the law, and to cast contumelious reproaches upon it tended to weaken the foundation of moral obligation and the efficacy of oaths, and in the case of Rex v. Woolston, S.T.R. 834, Fitz G. 64, on like conviction, the court said they would not suffer it to be debated whether defaming Christianity in general was not an offense at common law, for that whatever strikes at the root of Christianity tends manifestly to the dissolution of civil government. It tends to corrupt the morals of the people and to destroy good order. Such offenses have always been considered independent of any religious establishment of the rights of the church. They are treated as affecting the essential interests of of civil society. And why should not the language contained in the indictment be still an offense with us? There is nothing in our manners or institutions which has prevented the application of the necessity of this part of the common law. We stand equally in need, now as formerly, of all that moral discipline and of those principles of virtue which help to bind a society together. The people of this state, in common with the people of this country, profess the general doctrines of Christianity as the rule of their faith and practice, and to scandalize the author of these doctrines is not only, in a religious point of view, extremely impious, 
but even in respect to the obligations due to a society, is a gross violation of decency and good order. Nothing could be more offensive to the virtuous part of the community, or more injurious to the tender morals of the young, than to declare such profanity lawful. In English common law, as well as in American case law, the biblical value of human life is upheld. The sanctity of human life is such that the penalty for murder is death, on the one hand, but on the other hand, homicide is justifiable if the intention to prevent the death is to prevent the death of an innocent person. Blackstone's Commentaries, Volume 4, pages 178 through 180. In the confusion of our time, when law is in flux and right and wrong are interchangeable, the applicability of our legal heritage is constantly challenged. In the case at hand, interference with abortion, by either forceful or non-forceful means, is being contested. Just as the inviolability of the innocent preborn has been a topic of argument between pagans and Christians, so the means of stopping the killing of the unborn has become an issue of debate between the two parties. Unfortunately, a vast number of Christians have jumped to the other side of a line that should separate Christians from pagans on both issues. On the question of forceful intervention, they are withdrawn into an abject schizophrenia. They affirm that the preborn are fully human and deserving of the full protection of the law, and yet the same laws which, which justify intervention to protect the innocent born people from an assailant are denied any application in the case of the preborn. They belie themselves and cannot be taken seriously. Who can really believe that they believe their own words? It is the responsibility of Christians but especially pastors, to articulate the truth regardless of its palatability or political buoyancy. The wisdom of strategy is not the issue here. It is truth. Shall the whole truth be spoken concerning the humanity of the preborn? Shall their humanity be pleaded and defended on all rhetorical as well as action fronts, or just on those which are deemed winnable in the public debate? Occasionally, a righteous judge in the land will admit the necessity defense in court when defenders of the preborn are prosecuted for interfering with abortion. In this defense, the defendants do not dis dispute the facts surrounding their interruption of the business of abortion. They contend for the legal necessity of doing so for the purpose of rescuing a person from imminent death. One such case came before Judge Robert Burkhardt, for the District Court of Douglas County, Nebraska, on December 30th, 1989, 18 Christians blockaded the medical center in Omaha. On that day, 21 abortions were sh scheduled to be committed. The blockaders were arrested and charged with failure to leave the property under Municipal Ordinance 20-115. Excuse me, 20-155. <laughs> they were found guilty on February 21st, 1990 but appealed to the district court. The opinion of Judge Burkhardt, signed on July 16, 1990, reads as follows. The defendants contend that they were confronted with the choice of two evils. Either they might walk on the premises of a building not theirs and thus produce a criminal trespass, or they might refrain from trespassing and thus produce a greater harm, which would be the killing of these unborn babies. The defendants felt that the harm which would result from compliance with the law was greater than that which would result from the violation of it, and therefore the defendants felt they were justified in violating it. This is known as the necessity defense, or the lesser of two evils defense, and is recognized under the statutes of the state of Nebraska. Statute 28-1407, RRS 1943, provides in part as follows. Justification, choice of evils. Number one, conduct which the actor believes to be necessary to avoid a harm or evil to himself or another is justifiable if a. The harm or evil sought to be avoided by such conduct is greater than that sought to be prevented by the law defining the offense charged. In a courtly effort to pay some respect to the nefarious Roe v. Wade decision, the opinion says, It should be pointed out that the necessity defense is not in conflict with Roe v. Wade. Roe does not state that abortion causes no loss of life. To the contrary, Roe explicitly refused to answer that question. 
The Roe decision bars a state from protecting a fetus in derogation of a woman's right to an abortion in certain qualified situations. But Roe does not prohibit private individuals from treating the fetus as a human being. The judge continues explaining the necessity principle and then enters into the disputed question at hand. In most necessity cases, the question of which evil is the lesser is really not in dispute. No one in our society seriously debates whether property rights, to a reasonable degree, may be violated in order to save human life. Property is of less value than human life. Thus, the only question to be decided is the fact questioned, was the situation as extreme as the defendants alleged? Evidence is then cited in support of the proposition that the fetus is a human in imminent danger of death when he is taken to an abortionist's office. The good judge gives effusive notation regarding the development of the child, the techniques commonly used for his destruction, and the danger an abortion poses to the mother. He further observes in the ruling that the state rebutted none of the embryonic and abortion technique information presented by the defense. In conclusion, the court said, the only rational conclusion that can be reached from the uncontroverted evidence presented in this case is that abortion kills an unborn child, a human life. The evidence in these cases establishes, as a matter of law, justification for the defendant's actions. Commentators and case law uniformly agree that saving human life out of necessity generally justifies the violation of property rights. The court ordered the county court decision reversed and remanded with instruction to dismiss the state's complaints against each of the defendants. We prefer bricks over babies. The contemporary question which most pro-life folk just don't like to deal with is the use of force and the necessity defense. Two of the few legal scholars willing to step out from among their timid peers have been Charles Rice and Pat Monaghan. Both men assisted with the appeal of Kurt Beseda, 20 years for setting fire to four abortuaries in Washington state, and the trials of Matthew Goldsby and James Simmons, Pensacola bombings of 1984. In an article that appeared in The Wanderer, June 27, 1985, Charles Rice, professor at Constitutional Law at Notre Dame Law School, responded to the controversy surrounding the bountiful number of abortuary bombings that occurred in that glorious year of our Lord, 1984. Professor Rice expressed disappointment with the fact that, quote, some figures in the pro-life movement have uncritically denounced these young people as terrorists. Even more baffling was his observation that, quote, some pro-life critics have indicated that they are as much opposed to interference with an abortionist's property as they are to the abortionist's termination of the life of his victim. In reply to the question of legal theory, Professor Rice cites copious case law in support of the necessity defense, or what is also called the defense of justification. The legal point is that these defendants may be reasonably held not to have violated even the civil law itself. That civil law forbids the bombing or burning of buildings, but it also includes, as an integral part of itself, the basic common law principle that the destruction of property may be justified by the necessity of saving human life. The trial judge in the Pensacola case instructed the jury to that effect, although the jury, like good Germans during the Nazi regime, proceeded to convict the defendants. That common law principle is a legal embodiment of higher law. It has survived the Supreme Court's legalization of the murder of the unborn and the common law right of others to destroy property to save those victims. This, of course, is juridical schizophrenia. Professor Rice cites People v. Richards as an, as an example in support of the fact that the necessity defense has a long history of recognition as a sufficient justification for the destruction of property and it applies to actions taken to save the lives of others, as well as to those taken to save oneself. Federal courts have also recognized this doctrine. The salient point made by Professor Rice is the fact that abortuary bombers do not necessarily even violate the human law. They may qualify for the defense of justification or necessity, 
Even if they do not qualify under the technical requirements of that defense, the human law that protects abortion factories is, in that context, unjust and void as a law that purports to protect murderers against those who would prevent the murder by destroying the property scheduled to be used in these murders. Unfortunately, Professor Rice was not confronted with the same cases we face today, and we haven't heard him pronounce on the issue of justifiable homicide, which we shall below demonstrate also to be a principle of case law. Thus, when he said of Beseda, Goldsby, and Simmons, quote, They destroyed property to save innocent lives. Their actions were not inherently wrong as long as they did not intend to hurt anybody. We think he spoke short-sightedly. English common law provided to a greater degree than our own case law for the citizen's right to use deadly force. Two factors have engendered these restrictions. Number one, modern police forces have reduced the need for citizens to protect themselves unless one lives in the war zones of our cities. Number two, fewer felonies are capital crimes. Of course, this general trend of modern societies comes as a mixed blessing. As long as governments are prosecuting the evildoers and supporting good citizenship, ubiquitous policing is a blessing. However, when governments protect homosexuals and abortionists and throw Christians in prison for resisting baby killing, a large police force accompanied by outlawing of guns is a curse to the population. In the state of Michigan, in the 1980 case People v. Witte, illustrates the issue of police force replacing but not altogether supplanting the right of citizens to use deadly force. To wit, we quote from Witte, Despite the fact that some jurisdictions have cut back on the justifiable use of deadly force, many others have maintained the common law rule, and there is good reason for doing so. The fact remains that the police cannot be everywhere they are needed at once. The occasion may arise where the private citizen is confronted with the choice of attempting a citizen's arrest or letting a felon escape. In order to make a citizen's arrest, it is regrettable, but sometimes necessary, to make use of deadly force. The common law in Michigan recognizes this, but still stops far short of granting the private citizen a license to hunt down and kill those suspected of committing a felony. The use of deadly force is not justified if the person to be arrested is not, in fact, a felon. Additionally, and most importantly, the use of deadly force must be necessary either to meet deadly force or to prevent the felon's escape. Elimination or severe curtailment of the citizen's justifiable use of deadly force would ignore the practical limitations on the ability of law enforcement authorities to arrest every felon. The right of citizens to use deadly force has, in common law, been limited to repelling, quote, dangerous felonies such as murder, manslaughter, arson, rape, robbery, burglary, mayhem, kidnapping, and various types of felonious assault. Blackstone described the English common law as limiting the use of deadly force to defend against the commission or attempt to commit the forcible and atrocious crimes of murder, nighttime burglary of a dwelling, arson, robbery, forcible rape, and sodomy. More recently, deadly force has been justified on more restrictive grounds. In California, the first decision to apply the common law rule limiting justifiable homicide to cases of forcible and atrocious crimes is People v. Jones, 1961. In Alabama, Story v. State, has become the significant case in American jurisprudence reflecting this trend to narrow grounds for justifiable homicide. The limitation prohibits homicides except to prevent felonies, which involve a danger of great personal harm or, quote, some atrocious crime attempted to be committed by force. This limitation is today generally recognized. Any civilized society system of law recognizes the supreme value of human life and excuses or justifies its taking only in cases of apparent absolute necessity. There is yet another principle governing justifiable homicide which is not immediately apparent. Deadly force is justified in the attempt to capture a fleeing felon whom one is trying to apprehend. 
Interestingly enough, at common law, there was actually a broader privilege to use deadly force in arresting a felon than in preventing his criminal act. The California case of People v. Gilmore presents the case of a man who surprises a burglar at night and shoots him when the burglar runs away. The court reports as follows. On the evening of July 4, 1986, defendant fell asleep in his residence while watching television. At about 2 a.m., defendant awoke to the, no the noise of scraping outside his apartment. He went to, open his, to his open living room window and parted the curtains. There he encountered a burglar, Ronald Schmidt, standing on an extension ladder at window level approximately 18 inches from defendant. Schmidt was trying to open the window screen. Startled, defendant rushed to his bedroom and obtained a loaded handgun. Wearing only boots and underwear, defendant ran down the stairs and out the front door. Schmidt was still on the ladder, and defendant pulled it out from under him, knocking him to the ground. Schmidt leapt to his feet, facing the defendant. Defendant screamed, freeze, two or three times, as Schmidt backed away. Defendant then fired twice into the ground in front of Schmidt, and Schmidt turned and ran away on a zigzag course. Defendant fired four bullets in the direction of Schmidt, Schmidt, each of which struck the asphalt pavements behind the fleeing burglar. The bullet from the last shot ricocheted off the asphalt, and a fragment of it struck Schmidt in the back of the neck, killing him instantly. Citing the appropriate authorities, the court declared that homicide is justifiable, quote, when necessarily committed in attempting by lawful ways and means to apprehend any person for any felony committed. Quoting from the 1872 Penal Code, which has not been amended substantively since that time, private citizens are expressly authorized to make felony arrests and may lawfully use firearms while doing so. The particular case on which the Gilmore case leaned to identify burglary as a forcible and atrocious crime as a matter of law, thus qualifying it under the justifiable homicide doctrine, was People v. Martin. In Martin, an off-duty deputy sheriff, defendant, surprised two unarmed intruders who had broken into his son's house at night. When one of the fleeing intruders Disregarded the defendant's order to stop, the defendant shot and killed him as he climbed a fence and was about to get away. Defendant was charged with involuntary manslaughter. Trial court dismissed the case. The state lost on appeal. The Gilmore court upheld the principle that, quote, the use of deadly force by private citizens to apprehend felons fleeing from commission of common law felonies is justified, and in conclusion declares that, declared that Schmidt attempted to burglarize an occupied dwelling in the nighttime, and that defendant fired at or in the direction of Schmidt in an attempt to apprehend him as he fled from the scene of the crime. We hold that the defendant was justified in using deadly force to apprehend Schmidt. Abortionists, of course, travel to and from the scenes of crimes regularly. They commit felonies daily. Specifically, they commit murders in the fashion of serial killers. Abortionists would well be well-qualified objects of justifiable homicide on a number of grounds if their livelihood were treated as a felonious one. It can be argued that one should slay them as they approach their victims to do harm or even as they depart from the scene of the crime, after resisting citizens' arrest, of course, and this could be done without penalty. Manslaughter charges would be dropped under the principle of justifiable homicide. But the moral confusion of our culture, as well as the legal quandary, presents a problem to those who wish to be law-abiding and preserve peace and good order in the neighborhood. And there are many Christians who are not certain where their duty lies. Even in times of Holocaust, there must be some respect for authorities which God has ordained. And the question of the legitimacy of powers which may have lost their divine sanction is just that, a question. That question leaves many uncertain about the strategy they believe they ought to pursue. Law-breaking and killing of abortionists for the sake of saving human lives remains a puzzling issue, discomforting to discuss. Legal Schizophrenia and Moral Confusion We will suggest a posture to be taken by pastors and activist leaders. Let us summarize first the legal and factual situation. The fact that homicide is committed every time a human being is killed is not in dispute.
The fact that the killing of the preborn is homicide is disputed by some, not all, abortion rights proponents. The legality of abortion is disputed by those who argue constitutionally, a la the Tenth Amendment, that the Supreme Court is not supreme over matters where states retain jurisdiction, among which rights are all those not specifically ceded to the federal government. The legality of abortion is also denied by those who argue via natural law, a.k.a. higher law, the law of nations, international law, that the Roe decision is not lawful and therefore illegal. The legality of abortion finally is denied by that great throng of Christian American citizens who contend specifically on the grounds of biblical law and historic Christian theology that abortion constitutes nothing less than the murder of of an innocent child. The fact that abortion is legal de facto by virtue of citizen acquiescence to decrees issued by a lawless Supreme Court does not solve the de jure questions raised above. There are serious problems with the legality as well as the lawfulness of abortion. The schizophrenia of our nation and its courts, even in the post-Roe era, is manifest in the confused legal status of the preborn. Michael Hirsch, former Operation Rescue leader in Atlanta, now a practicing attorney, has demonstrated this with several examples. In 1980, the Vermont Supreme Court held that a viable fetus, although later stillborn, is within the meaning of the term person, as used in the state's wrongful death statute, which provides a remedy for the death of a person. Consequently, tort liability attaches when one negligently causes the death of an unborn child. Citation. Nine years later, the same court rejected the use of the word person to mean unborn children for purposes of the state's vehicular homicide statute. Citation. More consistent in the treatment of the child in his mother's womb is the South Carolina Supreme Court. In 1964, the court recognized that the preborn child had a cause of action in tort for wrongful death. Citation. Twenty years later, the court extended the same protection to the child who died through a criminal act, reasoning that, quote, it would be grossly inconsistent for us to construe a viable fetus as a person for the purposes of imposing civil liability while refusing to give it a similar classification in the criminal context. Citation, end quote. Many other jurisdictions recognize the child in his mother's womb as a person for purposes of computing welfare aid, citation, and for other family court services, citation. Unborn children are persons in traffic court, allowing at least one woman to beat a ticket for riding in the carpool lane. She and her unborn child were counted separately, citation. In addition, the unborn child is a person within the scope of insurance policies, citation, and can bring an action for wrongful death even though he is not born alive, citation. The fact is that there is legal confusion as well, as well as moral confusion. There is inconsistency and uncertainty regarding the legal status of the unborn, not only among the states, but within the boundaries of individual states. If the civil authorities are themselves confused, sometimes affirming, sometimes denying the humanity of the preborn, how shall we behave? Shall we not behave as if the child is a human being under law and take action to protect him? And shall this action not appropriately confront the authorities with the truth whenever such action is taken? Propounding the truth is a fundamental Christian duty. Arguably, a good strategy for abortion opponents to take is action which underscores the contradictions in order to force examination of the truth. Legal confrontation comes about through court cases. The political left has repeatedly used this tactic to advance its agenda before indulgent and godless judges. Typically, a law is broken as a test case, and by means of some asinine ruling by a pagan occupant of the courtroom bench, the law is perverted. Arguably, under our system of government, the violators, activists, were not guilty. They were charged but found innocent. On the presumption that they were right, they violated the law by burning the flag, for example. They were brought to court and acquitted alleged constitu constitutional right of expression. Law is thus changed. Now, many pious Christians might not like to sully their Christian walk by lowering themselves to the level of St. Paul and making appeals to Caesar, but some might opt for such a strategy. 
They might think it best to force the courts to reckon with their ambiguities, contradictions, and outright miscarriages of justice. There may be some who will display enough effrontery to legalized evil that they will publicly seat themselves in front of the door of the abortuaries in defiance of the Soviet-style high court U cases in hopes of both delaying child slaughter and forcing the courts to repent of their blunders. Presuming that they are right, they will violate the de facto law, hoping that the government will not prosecute or that a judge or jury will acquit. And they may well believe that they have not only offered no offense to God, but pending an acquittal will have violated no law of man either. There are, of course, others who care little for the disposition of the court or the prosecutor, their only interest being the protection of the innocent for a few hours. The same situation attends the ones who opt for forceful intervention. The intervener may well hope to be vindicated in court after burning down abortuaries or terminating abortionists. There may be a legal strategy, or there may be no purpose but the rescue of the innocent. We know far less about the intentions of such covert operators than we do about public blockaders of abortuaries. Christians will opt for various strategies to change the legal status of the preborn. And who can be so presumptuous at this late hour in the course of the Holocaust to lay claim to an exclusively superior strategy? The fact is that when an intervener intrudes himself into the abortion process and blocks doors, breaks tools, or uses force to stop a serial killer, he does no moral wrong. And he does no wrong under the current civil law unless the court convicts him. In the present situation of moral and legal confusion, the anti-abortionist may rescue the child by whatever means he deems necessary and let the court decide to do justice or uphold evil. When the deliverer is brought before the judge for saving a child, let the truth be proclaimed and let the judge and the nation bear the guilt of punishing the righteous. The job of proclaiming truth falls most heavily upon the pastors of churches. These, of all people, ought to defend the actions of those who proclaim the truth by their deeds. Those who proclaim the humanity of the child ought also to affirm those who have acted so faithfully to that message. When a man stands yet innocent before the law of the land, but charged with murder for terminating a serial killer, the job of the minister is to advocate justice. The job of the advocate of truth is to proclaim the legal personhood of the preborn. And in so testifying, he must proclaim the applicability to the preborn of laws which protect any other human beings. He must stand as a witness to the truth, and therefore the acquittal of the slayer of the abortionist. The doctrine of justifiable homicide applies to the case of the preborn because he is a person. To hold a position to the contrary is to belie one's testimony. It is to deny one's declaration of the humanity of the preborn. Did Tabitha Darden do the right thing when she intervened and broke the leg of the father who was sodomizing his three-year-old? And if she had been charged with assault or attempted murder, what would have been the right thing for ministers of the gospel to do? If the answer is that they ought to have advocated her acquittal, then we are in agreement. The right thing for the minister of the gospel to do with respect to the prosecutions of those who forcefully intervene to stop abortion is to contend for their acquittals.